The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the latest in our series of webinars on critical 4G decisions. I'm Caroline Gabriel. I'm the research director at Maravedis Rethink and your host for this call. Uh, before we get started, we'd just like to run a quick poll um, to see what the makeup of our audience today is. So, I'll ask Adlin to do that. Sure. So which part of the ecosystem do you belong to? Uh, we have 31% uh, operators, um, followed by, uh, actually we have um, analyst media uh, representing 46% of the audience, and then followed by uh, equipment vendors. Uh, there are still people joining in, so this results may be skewed, uh, but that's a picture of, of the audience today. Back to you, Carla. Great, thank you. Um, as I say, welcome to our webinar. Um, during these events, we present some key findings from our most recent research from MOSA, which is our Mobile Operator Strategy Analysis Service here at Maravedis Rethink. Uh, the service tracks in detail the deployment, the strategies, and the investment plans of the top 100 4G operators around the world, and many of those now commercial, um, some still in trial. Let's have a quick agenda. We're going to look um, briefly at the challenges um, that the operators are facing and some of the key solutions that they're expecting to adopt over the next five years. And as I said, these highlights are from, um, from the latest report um, that we have uh, conducted here at, at Maravedis. Um, so this is sort of hot off the press data about what the top 100 4G operators are planning to do in the next, uh, next few years. Just be a brief set of highlights to set the scene uh, for our guest speaker. Um, we're very delighted and honoured to welcome Wing K. Lee today, who's the CEO of YTL Communications in Malaysia. And uh, the bulk of this webinar will be uh, Wing explaining to us and discussing um, his business model and strategies for 4G. Just a couple of housekeeping slides. Um, this is a note about the webinar interface in front of you. Um, you can see uh, the grab tab is the way to open and close the various panels. Uh, there's a choice of audio. And most importantly, uh, you can submit questions. So please feel free to put questions into the box um, uh, indicated here. Uh, to extend at any point during the webinar, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can um, at the end after, uh, after Wing's presentation. Uh, we'd now like to run um, another poll. Um, please to uh, get some of your views, uh, uh, the audience views, about some of the issues that we're going to discuss today about 4G and new, te uh, new topologies. All right, so the second poll, I uh, uh, would like to have your opinion about you know, what kind of biggest reason for deploying small cells, uh, to increase coverage as a vital element of data uploading, uh, and the other responses are, are indicated in your screen, uh, so you can only choose one, uh, and please take a couple of minutes to, to answer. Thank you. And let's give it a few more seconds, a chance. Uh, we only have 60% uh, that have voted so far responded. Yeah, and people are struggling between different answers here. So. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite a difficult one. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll Okay. and share the results with you. Oh, quite interesting. We seem to have quite a, uh, a large section who are looking um, at this as uh, a way to increase coverage, and I think that very much 
fits in with the, find the um, response that we're getting from the operators that we talk to on a regular basis that be the first um, the first problem, first challenge they have is to uh, get mobile data coverage to everybody. Um, and then the second phase, increasingly shortly behind it, is to start adding um, adding capacity to that. So we can see that the second most popular um, answer is uh, as an element of data offloading, which is becoming, of course, a very important um, part of carrier strategies for managing all the data. And the, even 21% of respondents looking already looking forward to a full heterogeneous network. So some interesting results there. Um, just a couple of housekeeping points, which are on the screen in front of you. Um, we usually ask whether uh, the attendees can obtain the slides. The answer is yes, there'll be an email sent to you after the webinar with a link where you can download uh, the slides. Um, the event's also being recorded, so there'll be a link to, uh, if you want to listen to that, or some of your colleagues do in the future. And uh, the website address is there in front of you if you need any more information about any of the research uh, products that we're talking about today. So uh, as I say, just a few slides from me uh, really to set the scene for Wing and to give you some of the highlights of our most recent quarterly report, which is um, covering what operators deployed during the fourth quarter of last year and what they are forecast to do in up to 2017. I think we're very familiar with the challenge that most mobile operators face now. Uh, the amount that they need to invest in capacity um, in order to meet the huge rise in mobile data, 13-fold um, probably projected by 2017. Um, that capacity investment is often proving to be more than the additional the data revenues that they believe that they can get from these networks. Uh, clearly not a great business case. If they use only conventional technology, we forecast that their CapEx in 4G will continue to outrun the amount of revenue they generate at least until 2017 for the average carrier. So the solution is to use new topologies to get additional spectrum capacity um, and to use intelligent software to create networks that are far more flexible and basically deliver a much bigger bang for the buck, so to speak, in terms of um, capacity outlay. These new topologies, which we'll look at in a second, um, they're already bringing the sort of crossover date where we think that debt revenue does start to overtake new investment uh, by 12 months, and obviously the operators are hoping to bring that crossover forward even further. You can see that on the graph. So while early LTE uh, de deployments have mainly been very conventional, um, as we saw in that poll, they've been geared to coverage and large cells. Um, increasingly, as the operator's thoughts turn to low-cost capacity, uh, we're seeing radically different network topologies um, emerging. And a lot of uh, focus, of course, on making the cells smaller and smaller. 3G cells have already got a lot smaller than 2G were, so it's kind of an ongoing process. But there are whole new architectures coming into play now, such as the Metrocell, a very low-cost, all-in-one base station format, which can be mounted on a lamp pole. And also the distributed Tico cell, um, where, again, it's a small cell, but the baseband processing is not done on the site. It's virtualized on a server. It's a step towards a full cloud RAN which you're already uh, seeing being implemented by a few advanced uh, operators, generally in Asia. Um, all this moving towards the full heterogeneous network where um, operators are creating um, a pool of spectrum and capacity using different air interfaces, different spectrum bands, and a lot of carrier Wi-Fi, all uh, managed as a single seamless network. That's the dream. Most carriers don't believe they will achieve that until the end of this research period, but they're putting some of the building blocks in place um, on the way. There are many challenges to this, hence why most of them are not particularly confident that they're going to have a full HET net um, in the next year or two. Perhaps the biggest, in fact it always comes out as the, as the biggest when we, when we speak to the operators, um, is the problem of backhauling thousands and thousands of small cells. Um, we can see from the research here the technologies that will come into play. Um, and I think the overall theme here is that all, just about all carriers are going to have to use a complex mix of backhaul technologies. And the, the picture becomes more and more mixed as, as you move along. As you can see on the, on the graph, um, fiber is the ideal, of course. And in some uh, particularly Far East countries, uh, there is a lot of fiber being installed even with very small um, 
metro cells, for instance, it's mandatory with all new buildings in China. Um, a lot of operators will not have that kind of advantage, and so where they can't get fiber, they are looking to use wireless, but they want very specific solutions that are optimized for small cell saving cost um, and efficiency. Uh, and we're particularly, um, we're seeing some of these specific solutions emerging. There'll be a lot of them at Mobile World Congress um, next week, I'm sure. But also new bands. Um, for the first time ever, really, operators are discussing running out, possibly running out of spectrum for backhaul. That's never really been an issue before. So looking at new bands, such as perhaps using the 3.5 gigahertz band um, for backhaul, although in the US, that's very much favored for access. So there's a lot of regulatory hurdles also to, uh, to be addressed. Spectrum in general, of course, um, can't add capacity without extra spectrum. Um, so we are seeing operators looking at bands that really they would never have considered using until they, until they got to LTE, were considered very underused bands. So some carriers are lucky enough to have been able to acquire some of this spectrum when it was uh, considered pretty much useless, and it's now becoming a part of high value. One of the most important um, new types of spectrum coming into the mainstream is the TDD spectrum. Wing will talk more about this, but um, TDLT um, and its predecessor, WiMAX, have, have shown that, uh, in fact, the unpaired spectrum is very suitable to heavy-duty data networks. And even the carriers that have initially uh, deployed FDLT um, are looking to add TDD to their pool of capacity. Um, with techniques like uh, supplemental downlink and, in future, carrier aggregation. Um, LTE advanced will certainly make this uh, an easier, more standardized task. Um, but other bands that are coming into play that, again, were kind of ignored before, um, re-farming and even sharing existing spectrum. We're seeing lots of governments opening up their own spectrum for sharing by commercial operators. Um, but there still won't be enough. Uh, there's unlicensed spectrum coming into play with Wi-Fi. Uh, carrier aggregation does allow um, operators to blend together two or more bands um, in, in a very efficient way. But they will still have to be looking to use uh, many tools that just increase the efficiency of the spectrum that you already have, as we see on this graph. Those tools, um, things like new, particularly new um, antenna technologies, um, will actually account for the, the carriers think for over a third of their additional usable capacity and particularly as auctions, new auction spec, um, spectrum auctions start to dry up in many parts of the world. All that means that the network has to be more intelligent. Um, I think the, the overall message is there's no way anymore to achieve the capacity that's needed just by throwing hardware and spectrum at it. Both those resources will either dry up or will be too expensive. So they have to be used much more intelligently and efficiently. So we're seeing a huge focus um, on adaptive networks and even moving towards full software-defined networking. It's been very much a concept of the data center and the enterprise. Um, and now those ideas are coming out into the carrier land. Um, projects like um, NFV, Network Functions Virtualization, is an Etsy project um, to, in effect, create a software-defined network uh, platform that is really optimized for carriers because much of the work that's been done in the enterprise isn't optimal for what particularly mobile um, carriers need to do. So that's where we're heading to networks that, um, that uh, you know, deliver capacity where it's needed and turn it off where it isn't. Key trends to watch, um, caching video in particular, um, right at the access network and the cell site. That's um, a very efficient way to get to keep video where it's being used. Um, cell breathing, so cells that in effect expand and contract depending on um, the, the mobile data demand that's going on within them, um, and that's all done automatically in software. Um, Self-organizing networks in general are actually absolutely critical to a small cell network. Um, when you've got thousands and thousands of cells, they obviously can't be um, managed in real time in any manual way at all. They have to be able to adapt to one another automatically. And again, all these technologies are at their beginning. The next year to 18 months, we'll see a lot of them mature commercially, although full SDN, we're probably still talking four or five years away. Um, but they'll start to, to come into use step by step, rather like the new hardware technologies. Um, it, it will be an evolution rather than a sudden overnight change. And a final point from me, 
Um, it's fine building these these amazing intelligent networks, but of course uh, there has to be some, some profit back from those. Uh, the difficult lesson that most mobile operators have learned in the last few years is that just uh, consumer data is no longer um, a source of significant growth, or it won't be probably after this year. Although they're moving to more intelligent ways of charging, tiered data charges rather than all you can eat and so on. Um, but most are accepting that the days when consumer data ARPU is actually growing significantly are almost over. So incremental revenue to justify the investment in these new networks is going to have to come from new services. Despite many challenges to that, and much talk of the, of the Selco's just in effect becoming dumb pipes, um, our forecast suggests that the average mobile operator in our top 100 will add $150 in incremental ARPU from new services by 2017. Um, and some will achieve double that and more. Um, of course, others will be victims of consolidation or will decide that the bit pipe role is, is for them. Um, but generally, there is a lot of um, activity, intelligent activity going on um, around the operators um, to develop new sources of revenue. A lot of this focused on the enterprise, on vertical markets, on machine-to-machine -machine applications where there's a lot more budget, there's a lot more customer loyalty, and they can add a lot of value. Um, and increasingly, those sort of vertical applications have tended not to be wireless in the past, and they're now moving to mobile. So they are actually a new source um, of revenue, rather than just trying to squeeze an extra dollar or two out of uh, the consumers who are pretty much saturated. So hence, on the pie chart, that you see um, the categories where the operators um, expect to get uh, the most revenue, expect to be their top new revenue generator, specifically from LTE. Uh, you can see that a lot of the categories that are scoring highly there um, are actually not consumer at all, things like smart grid um, and enterprise cloud services. So a quick summary, and then we'll have another poll, and I'll pass over uh, to our guest speaker. Um, I hope this, uh, this sort of highlights of uh, the key findings from our, our latest report um, has given you an interesting taster, I think some general points to make. 4G, making a profit from 4G is going to require extremely complex thinking. This is not as simple business as it was in, in 2G voice. Um, carriers will have to harness almost anything they can get their hands on in terms of network technology, cell sites, um, spectrum bands, and so on. They'll need to shift their balance away from consumer services to generate um, incremental sources of revenue, especially, of course, with the decline of voice. Um, voice over LTE is important, but we regard it largely as a holding tactic. It's not something that we think will generate significant additional revenue. Um, and as well as generating these new services, that will have to be done in tandem with lowering, lowering um, the cost of the networks and the devices quite dramatically. Only some will succeed in this. Some will succeed fantastically. Some will fail. And the point of the MOSA service is to track the, the operators and identify those success factors and which operators we feel are setting the standard for the rest um, in order to share with our clients. So that's it from me. Um, I'd just like to run the second poll, and that's really coming to, back to the uh, this key issue of lowering the cost of backhaul as we go to small cells. Um, and then once we've done that, I'll hand over to Wing. All right, so our, our latest last poll here is uh, get a feedback from, from you, the market, uh, and understand what are your expectations in terms of uh, investment required for metro cell backhaul. Uh, and, and so, you know, some of you may have no idea, some of you may have a wish uh, uh, target price, uh, but uh, that will help us to, as part of our research, to uh, understand the market requirements for, uh, for pricing. So if you can take a few minutes here to uh, vote. Uh, uh, interesting to share the, the results. Um, give it a few more seconds. And I'm um, now closing the poll. And so, obviously, the, what's your reaction to that, Carla? Ah, I think we have a very optimistic audience. <laughs> Nearly half uh, believe that we're going to get below the $3,000 um, Mark, which uh, which is is necessary for sure to justify these these models and make them affordable. But I think perhaps some of our most carriers would 
think it might take a little longer to get to. So that as an average across their whole um, their whole network. Um, but but yes, it's, it's a, it reflects an important trend, and I think the backhaul industry is really rising up to the challenge of the reducing cost at this point. Okay, great. So uh, without uh, uh, no further ado, let's uh, give control to uh, our next presenter, Wendy. Great, and uh, we're just changing the screen. I'd just again like to welcome Wing K. Lee. Um, he is the Chief Executive Officer of YTL Communications, um, the challenger operator uh, in using 4G technology in Malaysia, one of the top growth markets for mobile broadband services. So welcome to you, Wing. Yes, good morning or good afternoon and good evening to all of you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Adeline and uh, Caroline. Uh, I hope you're seeing my screen okay. Okay, well, I would yes. like to first uh, start by giving you a brief introduction of who is YTL Communications. As you just heard from Adeline, one thing that uh, is interesting about Malaysia is that it is a very uh, interesting high growth market and due to the foresight of the government, uh, Get this, the government did not auction out the 4G spectrum. What the government has chosen to do was to give out the 4G spectrum through beauty contests. I think the fundamental economics behind this is quite smart, whereby in many other countries uh, that many of you are in, uh, spectrum is given out through an expensive auction process, which at the end, all these companies would have to recuperate uh, from the auction Right, so they pay from getting it uh, back from the consumers. So at the end of the day, it's still come back from the consumers. So one thing that the Malaysian government has done, which I think is quite uh, quite exciting, is that they uh, went by a merit-based approach to give out this spectrum, and it's a use it or lose it scenario. So obviously, it's our job to making sure that we use the money uh, that we allocate to this project as efficiently and as and as effectively as possible to create innovation. And I think uh, we have an interesting story that hopefully could uh, be uh, insightful to you guys. So YTL Communications is uh, the communications arm, or the internet arm rather, of the largest uh, publicly traded company in Malaysia. So our group, called YTL Group, uh, has a market cap of about uh, a little bit north of 11 plus billion US dollars. So as a result, the group decided to do something very unique. We decided to self-fund this entire project, as opposed to having to raise money from external investors who, as you might agree, are oftentimes driven by short-term motives. So having the luxury of not having to raise money publicly give us the flexibility and the freedom to believe to do something that we believe is uh, you know, for the right, right for the long term. And I think what we've done uh, with our 4G investment uh, can hopefully give you some interesting insights into our decision process that could potentially apply to your investment as well. So we launched our network in November 2010, which is a little more than two years ago. And uh, when we first launched, we have given the country something quite unique. We launched with a coverage of about 60% of the country's population footprint. And we have since gone from 60% to now over 75, uh, coming to 80% by middle of this year. We are now the largest 4G network in Southeast Asia with over 3,000 plus base stations and by Later on this year, we'll approach about 4,000 plus base stations. So there are three numbers that I'd like to share with you, just to contextualize our the backdrop of our investment into 4G. The first number is 100. In fact, the number is 100 plus, and that is the mobile penetration in Malaysia. Just like many uh, developing economies, mobile has been uh, since the day of the, its introduction to the country the primary means of communication. The fact is people have at least one device in their pocket that they can use to make them receive phone calls, send or receive SMS. Having said that, the next number is interesting. The number now is around 50. When I first uh, moved to Malaysia three and a half years ago, the number was much lower than 50. That is internet penetration. So when you have a country where 100 plus percent of the population has a device, the next, the, this number would affirm to you that majority of these devices are not capable of doing mobile data. The third number that is rather interesting is 26, and that is the medium age of Malaysians. Now, this is a very young country. It is a young populace that fully understands the power and the excitement of the internet, except that if you look at the previous number, they weren't given sufficient access to it. And that's why 
we decided that this is a fantastic opportunity for us to go in, even as a challenger, into this crowded market, so to speak, with 100 plus percent mobile voice penetration. But we see it, we see it differently. We are not interested to go in to compete by selling another SIM card. We're interested to compete by creating an economy, a new economy. As you can tell, the number 26, which is the populace of the medium age of 26, by exceed 50. Why is that case? Right? Certainly, purely from a mathematical standpoint, 26 cannot be larger than 50. But if you look at it from a supply-demand standpoint, then certainly the demand from a populace of 26 medium age certainly far out exceed the supply of 50% internet penetration. By the way, most of them are landline. So our critical decision, and the reason that why our board decided to fund this business directly ourselves, is that we feel that it's not important for us just to build a network to compete with the existing incumbents. We have already four rather well-built GSM network in this country. What we need is a platform to enable Malaysia to participate in the internet economy. We believe that there's a much more interesting opportunity to create value, exactly to Caroline's presentation earlier. Value creation is no longer by being a pipe. Value creation happens when we create value above and beyond what the pipe can deliver, which is how do we create value by creating relevance on top of the pipe. So if you were to look at the internet, I think we can all agree that internet is an identity-based architecture. What I mean by that is that you go to all these major websites. The first thing they ask you is, would you please enter your user ID? Once these guys understand you based on your user ID, they would offer you the best service experience that they could possibly do. And they'll constantly revise their backend architecture, their content services to continue to delight you. That's how the internet works. So from our perspective, because I have the uh, luxury, uh, along with my colleagues at YTL Communications, to start with a clean slate. We weren't burdened by legacy. So we thought, OK, let's be bold. Let's create a network from ground up that is entirely 100% compatible with the internet. So we did away with the SIM card. We created an ID-based concept. We created, in other words, an identity-based architecture from day one. Now, what that, that, what that gives us, as you can see in the subject line of this slide, is the ability to form a long-term relationship. I have many good friends in the industry. Many of them are in very, very large operators. One of them happens to be one in the largest operator in the world. And he told me that, Wing, my biggest luxury is that I have a huge base of subscribers. But my biggest challenge is that my only relationship with them is a SIM card, which is entirely disposable. Now, how do you create a long-term value when you have a piece of plastic that is disposable? So from our perspective, if we were to make the investment into the 4G world, let's make the investment with long-term relationship in mind. And that's why we created an identity-based architecture that is entirely compatible with the best practice of all the internet the, you know, top-tier players. Now, obviously, we are not just a data pipe. We also have a telco license. So what we've done is that we created an IMS-based platform that enable our subscribers to use the same Yes ID to make and receive phone calls, send and receive SMS, not just on net, but also off net and interconnected to all the carriers throughout the world as well. In fact, we go one step further because we do believe that our customers live not just in the internet world. They also live in the traditional telco uh, telephony-based world. So we also attach a mobile number to the SID. So basically, from an end user standpoint, their SID is ability, give them the ability to access our network, give them the ability to send and receive phone calls or SMS, as well as having a mobile number that allow them to make to be accessible from people outside of our network from the rest of the developing world as well. And to go one step further, the SID naturally lends itself to be an email address. So you add at yes.mine, that becomes the email address as well. And as part of this whole communication experience, we also allow for a cloud-based address book to be attached to the same ID. So whether it's email or phone call, or SMS, they are using the same address book that is synchronized to all the endpoints. That's what we've done 
fundamentally from day one. Now, we also found that, let's look at how people use the internet. People are not using the internet purely based on a one device, one user standpoint. We have evolved from the days whereby the whole house, the whole household used only one computer to access the internet, whereby nowadays one single person would have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine devices that they use to access the internet. That's quite clumsy, you know, if you were to think about a SIM card based scenario. How many SIM cards do you need? How many service plans do you need? Now we solve that as well. So we look at it and say, well, the world used the internet based on a concurrency concept. All that means is that people would have multiple devices that they want to use to access the internet. So from our standpoint, with the Yes ID, they give us a very elegant approach to allow for multiple devices to use the same Yes ID. So they, to the extent they log on using the same Yes ID and password, all these devices can access the internet at the same time, going against the same service plan. And also make and receive phone calls, send and receive SMS as well. In other words, what we've done from the first day that we launched our service is that we have launched the world's first shared data, shared telephony, shared everything service plan from day one. And I thought that's quite neat. Now, as you heard from us just now, we have developed not just a data pipe, but also an IMS-based platform that provides IP-based telephony. So in order to enable our customers to use this fantastic set of services, we have six devices and we are about to launch uh, another one, uh, and actually two more in the next uh, few months. But we have SS devices on the left-hand side of the slide. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see the converged uh, voice and data devices that allow for phone calls, SMS to be made. And you see on the far right, we even have our own smartphone that supports the GSM SIM card, which allows for voice communication on both networks at the same time. Now we've gone one step further, as you heard from Caroline earlier. Just providing devices to customers is one thing, and we can certainly do that. And you saw in the previous slide that we have a pretty robust portfolio of devices on our own. But we thought that, well, why don't we allow for people to play, uh, use our services over the, over the top as well. So if you look at this slide, you'll see that we also have our own cloud services. They allow for customers to actually access our telephony capability from any smartphones as well as desktop and laptops. The one thing that we have done through our Yes Live suite of application that basically is our telephony offer is that we provide one single number that is accessible to all these endpoints at the same time. We allow for multi-ring, which means that all these devices will ring at the same time when a phone call comes in, or the same thing goes for SMS. They all receive the SMS, and you choose to pick up from the most convenient device, and you answer back your SMS from the most convenient device at the time, whether you're traveling in between, at home or at the office. And most importantly, we are fully interconnected to the world, so this works uh, with uh, any numbers around the world. And most importantly, with our over-the-top offer, our customers can take the same device, whether it's an iPad, or an Android device or the laptop, travel to, let's say, Barcelona, so long they have a decent internet connection to give them at least 35 kilobits per second, which is not hard to get these days, then they can make and receive phone calls, send and receive SMS as if they are local. Therefore, no more roaming charges. So again, this is another way for us to create value. This is uh, just a close-up of the uh, UI that we've created. Uh, for our over-the-top of uh, applications, which I think uh, you, know, you guys have seen by now. So let's get to the next one, which is another product that we've launched most recently. You heard from, from me earlier is that we have created a messaging platform, a mail, uh, an IMAP-based mail platform for uh, YesMail. So what we've done with YesMail is that most recently, as of uh, two months ago, we enabled to the lower left-hand side the ability to make and receive phone calls even from the browser. So not only that you can do that as a desktop client on Mac or Windows, we give you access to smartphone clients on Android as well as iOS platform. You now, without any software download, can go to web.yesdive.my and from that point on, you can make and receive phone calls from within the browser. The same goes for SMS. And as you heard from me just now, we've created our own smartphone, the Eclipse, that basically is the world's first converged uh, multi-mode 4G device, which allows for 
do more operations between GSM network as well as our YES network. They allow for data connectivity as well as voice telephony capability and advanced telephony capability as you can see in the screen right now or a video call uh, that happens right here on our network. Now, also important, uh, as you heard from Caroline, is about the uh, ability to provide content services. So we developed a portal called Yes Well. Yes Well is a window to the world, so to speak. It allows for our subscribers to have easy access to all the news that they care about. We have our own editorial staff that provide a Malaysian perspective to the world. They help our customers connect to the world as well as connect it to local news as well. And this is a media-centric site that provides access to high-quality videos, uh, you know, high-quality photos, as well as, as you can see, uh, ability to share and connect socially as well. Now, we do all this not for the fun of trying to compete with uh, Yahoo News or compete with MSN or BBC for that matter. From our perspective, it is all about building lifelong relationship. To the extent that our customers, through the YesID, they have access to high quality internet service, have access to high quality low cost telephony services, and have access to content services. Then we have an ability to build relationship, elongate the eyeball time, and from that, from that point on, create opportunity for advertising, for commerce, and so on. And we are also quite proud that uh, we have built a, from the ground up, uh, internet-based business model. So our subscribers, this is our yes.my, which is our website. Our subscribers can subscribe to our services. They can pay their bills. They can change plans all online. In fact, because we don't need a SIM card, we've dealt the need of a physical SIM card. Everything is virtual. Our yes ID is virtual. What it means is that our customers can actually use our services, subscribe to our services, pay their bill, and service themselves from the comfort of their own home. So I think uh, we've done some good work. So uh, IDC also concurred, and so did Wall Street Journal. So I think uh, it's good to get some external validations. Um, in 2011, uh, we also received the world's best new service award at the Bottom World Forum. And uh, last year, we picked up the uh, recognition as Asia's most innovative service provider uh, by Frost and Sullivan. So in summary, I'd like to say that uh, the path that we've chosen to travel certainly is not what conventionally what people expect. But then again, uh, if we were to uh, allow me to quote from the famous Henry Ford, if he asked his customer what they wanted, they would have asked him to uh, get them a faster horse. So from our standpoint, 3G network is a good network for the sake of offering a solution to bridge the gap between the voice world and the data world. With 4G, we have an opportunity to approach a data-centric world and internet-centric world holistically. The question is that do we want to look at 4G as a faster 3G, or do we look at 4G as a new way to create a new economy? I think uh, the path that we've chosen suggests that the latter path is the, uh, the latter part of the uh, answer would be a more interesting one. With that said, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, <coughs> Wing, uh, pardon me. Uh, that was really interesting, and I, I think um, it chimed in very well with some of the, the key findings that have come out of our survey of the, of the 100 operators around the world. Obviously, some of them, like you, in a challenger position, some very incumbent, but um, all, facing, um, all facing the same kind of issues. Um, I'm interested to... Uh, I think, as we saw, there's almost um, operators almost becoming um, over the top style. I mean, a lot of the services that you showed us are very much what we'd expect from from over the top providers. Um, so I'm wondering how much further you might take that. In uh, would you actually, at some point, offer your services on um, another network, for instance, or become really an internet provider? Yeah, yeah. So good question, Caroline. Um, the funny thing is that uh, if you look at our over-the-top uh, applications, they all run on devices that we don't we don't have. <laughs> right. So the, the good news is that we built our network three years ago. At that time, there was no such thing as LTE, right? 
So at that time, I mean, when we chose the technology, we chose WiMAX. And WiMAX, and we are very proud with the WiMAX because, as you said earlier, with WiMAX, we now have ability to actually uh, have a very well built foundation to support the TDD. So with a TDD based foundation that we have with WiMAX, uh, certainly we can wait for the TDD systems to uh, show up on and, uh, beyond uh, the, there are some background noise there. So beyond using the TDD ecosystem to help solve the uh, device question, which you know will be a situation that would be a, a year or so away, right? So in the interim, the answer is that how do we make sure that our customers can use whatever device they search? Yeah. So from our standpoint, OTT is a perfect answer because with OTT. We now have ability to say that customer, please keep your Galaxy S3 if you like. Please keep your iPhone 4, iPhone 5 if you like. Please keep your iPad. And here's our application with the same Yes ID. You can sign on, right, uh, over our Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, you know, we have this mobile hotspot. Uh, we have actually two of them mm. that provides a mobile, as you as you might as you guys may call it, a MIFI, the ability for people to connect via Wi-Fi over this little tiny device that you can put in the pocket to our 4G network. So we say to our customers, very simple, we have a fantastic opposite, uh, proposition for you. All you need is to keep your favorite devices, you buy one of our uh, mobile router, you get the same Yes ID, with the same Yes ID, you sign into the mobile router, you have fantastic 4G data service, and you download our OTT app from, our, you know, from your favorite uh, iOS device or Android device, you can use our voice services as well. There's no compromise. Yes. The, the sort of follow-on from that is, why are you building a network, and why not just be a, an OTT service provider? Yeah, I think there are two dimensions to this, uh, Caroline. I think from a voice services standpoint, we, we choose our battle very wisely, I think. First of all, when it comes to data, we reign supreme. When mm -hmm. Malaysia, I don't think there's any wireless data network that can be faster, more robust, and larger than ours, right? So as far as data, we are very comfortable. We are the data leader when it comes to wireless data in this country, and that position is not going to be taken by other people anytime soon. So when it comes to data, we feel that our devices, obviously, would have a fantastic opportunity to give our customers a fantastic data experience. Yeah. All, what we are saying is that we don't have like the 7,000 base stations that the existing GSM operators have. Now, I think it's a very important point that uh, people have to pay attention to. Right? Just because you have a GSM network doesn't mean you have a data network. Just because you have a GSM network with 7,000 base stations doesn't mean that all these base stations are capable of doing data, right? So as far as local competitive landscape is concerned in Malaysia, majority of our competitors, they have a large voice network, a legacy GSM network but their 3G footprint is quite a bit smaller. So as far as we are concerned, when it comes to data to data com competition, we are standing very tall in terms of the size of our network relative to the 3G network and our performance of our network relative to the 3G network. So that's an important reason to recognize that we have a fantastic opportunity to win in this market and use, voice as a da use data as an entry point into the market. But to answer the question about ARPU, granted, just offering a pipe is not good enough. So as yeah. far as we are concerned, if customers, based on their pers uh, personal preference, wants to keep the existing devices, we say, go ahead, go for it, keep your devices. But guess what? Beside we have a fantastic data service for you, we also give you these value-added services called voice services that you can just download a simple application and you can use it from, the app from your favorite device right there. So we are trying to give our customers a complete solution that comprises of data, which is a scenario that requires a device to connect to, as well as voice, which in this case, we virtualize the voice platform that gives us the ability to address not just the Malaysian markets, but globally as well. Sure, sure. Um, I can see some um, from the questions um, from the audience. There's, there's quite a lot of interest in um, the fact that your, all your spectrum is in high frequency. Um, and wondering about the possible disadvantages of that and whether ideally you would like some low frequency spectrum also for, for yeah, coverage yeah. in particular. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a fair question. 
So I think uh, if you look at the 2.3 spectrum, which is the spectrum that we have, and we also have some 2.6 as well, uh, it is very ideal for data services. By definition, when you have something in high frequency bands such as 2.3, 2.6, or even for that matter, uh, 2.1, then you're well positioned for high capacity network. Right? And when it comes to the data performance, I think high capacity network is the way to go. You can't really have a network running at 700 megahertz and still sustain the same performance throughput as a high frequency network. For the simple fact that at 700 megahertz or the lower frequency band, whether it's 800 or 900, you have to, you have to deal with interference. And last I checked, we can't tell the radio how to travel, right? So it's very hard to run a low frequency network, such as 700, and still maintain a high performance footprint. So from our standpoint, if we were to claim the data leadership, Let's claim the data leadership, taking advantage, taking advantage of our high frequency uh, spectrum footprint, and take the leadership all the way. When it comes to penetration for, let's say, in building, I admit that this is a uh, a challenge uh, for the high frequency networks. So we augment that uh, macro network of ours with pico based stations, and obviously uh, we are also paying attention to small cell, which is another interesting development that can help augment uh, our macro network to give us better. Uh, coverage in uh, in uh, in challenging areas or so high density, super high density areas. Absolutely, that makes sense. And related to that is another question that um, I've received on: um, Could you enlarge on any plans to use Wi-Fi in your network? To because the services that you even uh, outlined very eloquently um, at some point will will take an awful lot of capacity, won't they? So, do you see Wi-Fi as a um, you mentioned your hotspot, but do you, do you see Wi-Fi as a useful strategy in future for the network itself? Yeah. So Wi-Fi is interesting, right? Because to a lot of companies, Wi-Fi is a well. I kind of have to have Wi-Fi because I have to offload. So it's not like they love Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi can help add to their output, right? Is this really yeah. a way for, for them to deal with capacity uh, challenges uh, in the in the 3G uh, network? Whereas in our case, because as you rightfully said, we are a challenger brand. As a challenger company, uh, our our position is to acquire. Our position is less about offload. Our network has sufficient capacity. We are doing quite well when it comes to capacity management. So we look at Wi-Fi uh, a little bit differently. Number one, uh, we already have uh, pretty significant ownership uh, when it comes to the mobile hotspot market, i.e. our MIFI or our mobile router. Uh, I think we are the market leader for sure in Malaysia because of the high capacity 4G network. Uh, as a back call to the hot Wi-Fi uh, mobile router, I think our customers have fantastic experience. So from our standpoint, um, it is about using Wi-Fi to give customer one more reason to sign up for our service. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you come to Malaysia, which uh, all of you guys attending this call are welcome to come to Malaysia and uh, drop me a line, and we'll be happy to uh, to, 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 to help. Okay. But uh, when you get onto the high-speed rail from the airport to downtown KL, that high-speed rail travels at 160 kilometers per hour. You will get Wi-Fi services there. And that Wi-Fi services, guess what? It's back called by our 4G network. So if you take the same metaphor, which is any mobile transit devices, if you have a Wi-Fi hotspot there, and you can en enable customers to enjoy Wi-Fi services through these transit vehicles, back called by our 4G network. As far as we are concerned, this is a very interesting revenue opportunity. It is less about offload. To us, it's about new, new revenue and new opportunities to acquire. Subscribers. That's um, and that sort of leads to uh, another issue about how you constantly um, gain additional additional sources of revenue. Um, as we saw in uh, the slides I presented, um, operators like yourselves are having to continually invest in the networks and need more and more revenue streams to justify that. Um, you, you've, uh, your presentation was great because it was very focused on what those revenue streams might be. But I wonder if there are other further ones that you're looking ahead to for the next couple of years, but particularly perhaps on the more enterprise or vertical side of things. Yeah, yeah, that, thank you for asking. So one thing that uh, I, I, I didn't talk about at length, uh, because I'm conscientious of the amount of time that uh, is allocated, uh, but uh, one project uh, along the line of your questioning, uh, we are, that's one project that we are quite proud of. And it's not something that we are doing for the next several years. It's something that we have done already. 
and we are halfway done and will be done by uh, latter part of this year, is that we have um, built a virtual learning environment that enable all 10,000 schools in the Malaysian school systems to connect via our network and have access to high quality online learning capability. And this is not a pipe stream, this is a project that is actively being deployed. We have now finished 4,000 schools. We have about 6,000 small schools to go uh, over the next uh, two, two quarters or so. And by that time, we will turn the entire country footprint of schools, to all 10,000 of them, into schools that are 4G connected, point number one. And point number two, and more importantly, ability to actually deliver a virtual learning environment that allow for all the Malaysian school kids to actually learn interactively and collaboratively. Now, the reason that why we are so proud of this, it goes without saying that this is a huge country building opportunity that we have embraced, and we are grateful for that. But more importantly is that we have shown that our 4G network, with our nationwide footprint, can actually deliver high quality vertical solutions. Learning, education is one instance of how this vertical solution could manifest. But certainly, imagine if you could deliver a 4G network that provide a virtual private network capability to allow for school kids uh, across 10,000 schools to connect and collaborate and interact with each other. Imagine how you can actually enable the same capability to a financial institution, to a trading house, to a agricultural, uh, you know, uh, uh, multinational, uh, or any manufacturing organization. The list goes on. So once you have the capability to actually use a 4G network to enable mobile internet services that allow for people from all over the country to be productive, then I think the sky is the limit when it comes to how you can create value. Absolutely. And I think we have time for just one more question um, from the audience. And uh, this is about back home. Malaysia obviously has a very diverse geography, and um, we're wondering about a little detail on uh, what backhaul options are available to you for your network. Right, so uh, I think you listed them quite nicely uh, in your chart earlier, but uh, as far as we are concerned, we have two fiber optics uh, backhaul uh, at the national uh, backbone, so we actually uh, load balance our traffic uh, between two different providers, and this also gives us the ability to have some degree of uh, port resilience. Uh, as far as um, microwave is concerned, we also deployed microwave, uh, high capacity microwaves uh, to help augment our network. So the combination of fiber and microwave is, the, uh, is what we currently use. Grant, granted, down the road, we'll look into other options as well. But right now, what we have, and that has worked well for us, is a combination of microwave and fibers. Great. Well, sadly, I um, think uh, that's, we're running out of time now, uh, although I'm sure we could continue to discuss this all day, but uh, um, I'll wrap up there. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Um, if you have any more questions um, about the content or about the services that we offer at Maravedis Rethink, please do uh, contact us. There are um, contacts on the slides in front of you. Um, and you'll also be sent um, links where you can download slides and get in touch with us further. Um, so do address any further questions to us. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and attendance. And in particular, of course, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Wing Lee for a great presentation and discussion. Um, and I expect lots of people will be in Mobile World Congress. And if so, please have a nice time in Barcelona. That's it for today. Thank you. Bye-bye.